Johan? Okay, yeah, well, yeah, thank you, Johan. And I, I, of, of course, on behalf of SCI, I also would like to welcome you here. We have already talked this morning to each other very briefly, and actually we called on you to stage to celebrate the fact that you are also really celebrating a birthday party this year with UNEP turning 40 years old, 40 years of very, very hard, strong work on environmental issues that, and in a world that has changed quite dramatically, and also UNEP has changed quite dramatically, and I, I think that under your leadership, not least, it has changed dramatically over the last uh, years as well. So we are very, very interested to hear your perspective of that. Maybe a little bit, not just Rio, because Rio is only two months from now, and, and I, we have high expectations for Rio, and we have to continue to have high expectations for Rio. I think it's our duty to have high expectations, regardless of what some governments are arguing. But I think we should continue that. It's not over yet. But also maybe a little bit also, you know, looking ahead, beyond Rio, what, where do you see also UNEP, where is, where is UNEP heading? Uh, what kind of, what kind of um, mandate are you also looking at for UNEP in the next maybe decade to come as well, beyond, beyond Rio? We heard this morning the, the, the king <laughs> said, the Swedish king said that, well, I hope we can be back for Stockholm plus 50 and the world is a much pla better place then, and then we can really celebrate. So these 10 years we have ahead of us, where are we then? So, dear Achim, we are really pleased to have you here, and the floor is yours. This is only for the web, so it doesn't give a sound out here, but if you could stand here and yeah. speak to the web, we would appreciate it, so please. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Johan, thank you, Johan, thank you, Johan. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can see that there is a certain tradition that prevails here. Yeah, uh, simple, probably. Is there actually any meaning to your surnames, I mean, uh, in the literal sense, or it's just a name? Uh, it has a lot of meanings to our surnames. It means the great thinker, no. It's <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good, sounds yeah. good. Well, I can't compete with that, but thank you very much, and it's really, really wonderful to finally be here. I didn't walk past your building once for some conference that took place here, but I've never set foot uh, in this building here, although you have only moved here. When was it that the SEI actually? Five years ago, yeah. And to also see some of the faces that have been sort of accompanying my life, actually, not just UNIPS, but uh, even beforehand in terms of uh, the work that you do here. And um, in a sense, to come here this afternoon, just first of all, to say thank you for all the amazing work that you do on behalf of the environmental community, on behalf of people around the world, both as a, as a knowledge center, but I think also as an expression of um, what I would say, and this sounds a bit prosaic, Sweden's generosity to the world, because I think what is interesting that very often things have begun to take root in a global debate where you know, your institutes um, have been fundamental in terms of either the knowledge base or even the architecture of a process, but you have, as is such Swedish tradition, never insisted on, you know, putting your flag right on top and saying, this was us, this is me, this is I. And I think it speaks to this incredible tradition that you have in Scandinavia, but also in particular in Sweden when it comes to development, sustainable development and the environment field. So our relationship as institutions precedes us both, or maybe even us three. Um, but I think we have all learned to build on great ideas that were planted a long time ago. And you know, just as we meet here in, in Stockholm on the 40th anniversary almost of the Stockholm Conference, um, and Johan uh, the first has <laughs> uh, just come over here from a meeting that's taking place on short-lived climate polluters. And, you know, it's yet another example of how we have been able to, to join hands in something that I consider, I mean, speaking about UNEP also, a central part of, let's say, the time that, you know, maybe one day people will associate with my time in UNIP, which is to shorten the distance, as I call it, between where science emerges and policy mm. is empowered to act. Mm. I think that that is something that preoccupies me tremendously because one of the phenomena that we confront today is, um, in addition to the fact that we are producing more and more evidence of environmental change on the planet, mm. the, the added dramatic factor, I think, is time. Mm. You know, we sometimes have to confront debates in our societies today about, well, Club of Rome didn't happen, this didn't happen, that didn't happen. Well, first of all, I think if people actually went back and studied what some of these reports said, uh, even Brundtland uh, and then 1992, the Rio Earth Summit, I often 
caricature the state of where we are today is that the future has actually arrived. You know, we used to talk in the conditional, we used to talk in future tense. You used to talk about things that are going to happen in the future. Today, we're actually documenting what is happening out there, and we're even not able to catch up with quite the dramatic nature of environmental change that is already occurring in just metric terms, but also in terms of its implications. And I think that's the second sort of thread that I have tried to, I think, amplify from where my predecessors worked and where the community has worked through UNEP, which is for quite some time, I think UNEP was to some extent, partly because of its location and its identity also as being a program that was firmly rooted in the development conundrum, that we need to not only talk, but think, research, act, and develop responses in systems approaches. I think, you know, from a scientific <coughs> ecological perspective, that's nothing new. But I think for a long time we were able to pay lip service to that notion because our understanding of the system was so patchy that it was very difficult to give systems-related advice when it comes to actual policy implementation. So that's the second, I think, sort of thread that I have tried to reinforce, I think, in, in the time that I've been uh, in UNEP. And I'm combining a little bit sort of mm. where we are right now, where we are, <clears throat> in a sense, heading as an international community. And as we look towards Rio uh, 2012, I mean, we can spend a lot of time debating why the summit is not sort of, um, has not lit the candle from both ends and why it is unlikely to be a summit that people will refer to for generations to come as one of those milestones. But, you know, one should not yet uh, in a sense, close the bracket around Rio because 60 days is a long time in international summit politics and who knows what might still trigger some very meaningful outcomes out of Rio. So while I am you know, very concerned at the lack of political energy around the meeting, at also a, in a sense, disinterested and disenchanted you know, civil society, mm. um, a skeptical private sector, the fact of the matter is that we are having a summit about sustainable development at a point in time where the world is in the midst of a number of very disruptive you know, events that are happening. And in a sense, I would say it's almost yearning for a moment where political leaders would come together and say, look, despite everything that we debate and argue about, despite everything that divides us in political terms and economic interests, here we are as leaders of the world, we stand together because we have a common horizon, we have a common objective of how to address anything from you know, the ecological developments, the you know, unbelievable unemployment statistics and poverty numbers that we are still dealing with. So give Rio a chance till the last day when it's over. And I would say you know, if not great things come from it, it will remain an event. Mm -hmm. It will be a conference. Um, hopefully it won't do any damage by taking us backwards. But the underlying, let's say, things that we have been looking at, working on, and promoting, I think will continue to evolve. And um, <clears throat> I was last Friday at a, a congress uh, in Berlin called the McPlanet Congress, which is, let's say, a sort of biannual meeting of um, the more activist part of uh, German society, but also international representatives talking about these issues. And, um, I was struck by a level of frustration and disillusionment almost with all those things that many of those who are now middle-aged to close to pension age were actually architects of, right? The environmental movement has also uh, matured um, and many of those who are now in leadership positions in the NGO community, even scientific institutions, are conveying a sense of um, almost uh, disenchantment with the hopes and aspirations that they associated with the institutions, the conventions, the legal instruments that they spend often, you know, 10, 20 years working on. And that's obviously troubling because if you confront that sort of almost sense of disengagement from some of these international processes, so where will people turn to and where will the world turn to to actually discuss this? And by extension, this applies as much to the UN as it does to a G20 or a Davos meeting. And I think it's interesting that for many people, there is actually not really a big difference between all of these different arenas. They are the people up there who are not getting it right for us down here. And I think this is, you know, you can call it Occupy Wall Street, you can call it some of the radical movements that we see in, in some of the developing countries, but it's a, it's a threat that we have to deal with. The, the ability of our institutions 
at the international level to be responsive to what also you very often analyze is now the imperative for action is a real problem for us because we are not able to to convey to people a sense of optimism that the institutions, the platforms and the processes we have today internationally are adequate in terms of yielding a response that uh, is commensurate with the challenges that you document every day in your work. <clears throat> in, hidden within that discussion, I think, is a, uh, another phenomenon that is to me increasingly one that preoccupies me and I think it has to do or is best perhaps characterized by this wonderfully complex scientifically sounding and very intellectually um, sort of um, yeah, tasting term of living in the age of the Anthropocene but I think um, to me increasingly that that notion is actually in very important because what I find <clears throat> you know strikes me as more and more clear is that one of the reasons why we are not able to generate the kinds of responses that our knowledge would, if you want, dictate, is that for most people it is simply not comprehensible yet that the pace of environmental change has reached the scale, the speed and the, the implications that we often talk about in scientific analysis. It is very difficult to conceive that in less than 200 years you go from being a species, by all means very intelligent and you know, arrogant or whatever you want to call it, to being in a sense a dominant uh, player in a planet or on a planet where you're able to alter the fundamental life support systems of this planet from the atmosphere to the biosphere to the oceans to the fish stocks to the forests. So I think many people, while they appreciate that something is going wrong, I think haven't even begun to appreciate quite how dramatic the pace of change is. And that is why we are living in a sort of time warp between the evidence screaming out and saying, look what is going on, and our social, political, economic system simply not being able to respond. That is why in the last um, three years, we have in UNIP also taken up very much something that you have done in the Bayer Institute and many did, let's say, originally through either an alternative paradigm of um, an economic system or an economic discipline uh, by taking a very simple challenge and asking ourselves how on earth do we make the environmental community more economically literate? Because one of, to me, the most frustrating experiences of the last 20, 25 years has been to watch environmental science constantly being essentially silenced, whether at the cabinet level or in a TV talk show or in any public debate, by you just having spent you know, with great energy and intelligence explaining something like carbon dioxide emissions and somebody says, yes, but you know, we need economic growth, we need employment, you know, our country has to remain competitive, full stop, end of debate because all you come back with as an environmentalist is with more CO2, which doesn't answer the question of what people intuitively are worried about. And no, you know, nowhere is this more the case than in today's Europe or indeed in today's China or in today's Latin America. Mm -hmm. And when you have a country like Spain with close to 50% youth unemployment, that is an insane moment for any uh, governance uh, discussion about how on earth are we going to move forward. And we know that in many developing countries, the majority of the population is either you know, underemployed or not properly employed in any sense of the word. So making, in a sense, the environmental knowledge base economically viable from the point of view of how our societies today debate their directions has become a, let's say, key part of the intellectual discourse that UNEP has tried to not invent, because this is a discourse that has been maturing for 20, 30 years, you know, and many of the names have probably passed through this very haloed uh, set of institutes here over time. But I think what we perhaps were able to give it to was an expression in terms of a platform and a focus on how to go back into society and engage politicians, economists, finance ministers, all those viziers of, you know, there is only one way of doing it and challenging them with their very own tools, analysis and instruments by drawing on you know, the work that ranges from the geo reports or the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, the Planetary Boundaries work, but giving it some form of 
let's say, economic metrics with which at least you could not shut the door anymore to this without having to either counter the argument or you know, simply say, I'm not interested. Mm. And I mention this because, again, the link from where we were as a, let's say, early warning system from a scientific environmental community to having become, in less than 20 years, particularly from the trajectory of climate change, the most probably disruptive fundamental change agent in the economic system that we know today for the last 100, 150 years, is something we should actually study more carefully. Because people often forget that in less than 25 years, we move from a meeting of atmospheric scientists, and some of those even took place in Nairobi, and the world, you know, didn't even know about it, ignored it, laughed about it, talked about scientists, you know, having perhaps nightmares or something, to having an IPCC, to having a convention, to having a Kyoto mm -hmm. Protocol, to now having the largest single international financing instrument, apart from the bailing out funds of the INF, uh, being mobilized in support of a fundamental shift in, in the structure of our economies that will cover you know, transport, <coughs> energy, buildings, cities, um, mobility, everything. And I think we have to recognize that however much economics is a reductionist discipline, I am an economist, so I, I will happily take the critiques if anybody disagrees with that, it is also in the first instance a discipline and not an ideology. And I think one of the interesting things for me has been to try and in a sense, use the discipline economics to give voice to what otherwise is uncommunicable policy material <clears throat> if you simply talk about carbon dioxide, loss of species, etc., etc. Now, one of the questions I would love to pose for this afternoon's discussion is <clears throat> that we, we um, find ourselves now with a summit and one can you know, speculate why that has happened, that has actually picked up this green economy theme and has put it as one of its two central themes, which in some ways has been fantastic because it has mm. you know, given the rise to a sort of explosive discussion across the planet. What does green economy mean? What does it not mean? Who will it hurt, etc.? It probably came a bit early in terms of a maturing of that policy discourse. But one of the things that I find intriguing <clears throat> is that mm. some of our environmental and social movements uh, particularly at the more, let's say, critical end of the social spectrum, are struggling with that concept. And what is behind that? Is it the discourse? Is it the fact that they fear that it will distract from the contradictions that have to unveil them or reveal themselves, almost in the old Marxist logic? Or is it simply a, um, a struggling community that uh, by forcing an economic policy dialogue is perhaps not quite comfortable with where it can really retain its uh, you know, fundamental core identity. We now have a situation where we are going to Rio. Um, we are going to debate something that, in fact, is already happening in many parts of the world. And my main concern for Rio on the green economy would simply be that we do get that concept um, embedded in the sustainable development agenda to ensure that particularly poorer and least developed countries are not left behind. We don't have to worry about the Chinas or the Brazils or the South Africas and the older yeah. economies in the OECD world. The, the, the compelling <clears throat> rationale for moving down that line is there. The question is, mm. can we accelerate it? Can we make the transition easier and the disruptive nature perhaps um, slightly less dramatic? But it is for Africa, it is for small island developing nations that the transition towards a green economy is perfectly rational from my vantage point, but it is also extremely difficult because finance, human uh, resources, and also institutional capacity and access to technology is not the same as for China, Brazil, or India, or South Africa, and a few others. And that is why I believe this discussion is so key in Rio as a way of, of, of locking that in. Final <coughs> point, maybe just to also provoke from you some feedback, governance. Um, I personally was convinced when I was um, elected to, to head UNIF that I wouldn't touch this thing with a barge pole. I had watched <laughs> my predecessors uh, go through incredibly intense processes. Having then spent two or three years inside UNIF and inside the United Nations, I reached the conclusion that if we're ever going to go beyond the sort of um, comfort blanket that you know, was created in 1972 by establishing a United Nations environment program and so on, 
and to graduate to the point where environment ministers truly have a platform where they can exercise environmental governance on behalf of the international community, then we would have to move that platform that UNEP, in a sense, provides as a program to the next level. Because today's environmental governance is you know, a recipe for exactly what we have, which is a lot of experimentation, a little bit of progress here, but always keeping the environment in a box and preventing the environment ministers from exercising truly a collective um, response in the sense that they can take decisions, they can develop norms, standards, policies, and they also get implemented. Mm -hmm. And that is, if you want, the formal difference between a program and a specialized agency. It's less to do, I always emphasize, with the secretariat and the organization. Mm -hmm. so it is actually about governance. And uh, I'd be interested what your take is on that, because, and I end with this, my vision um, of an environment minister is not this sort of disheartened, frustrated view that, you know, we invested in you as an environmentalist and you're still a weakling and, you know, we're going to abandon you and we're going to go back to the finance ministers or the agriculture ministers. I actually believe one day uh, the environment ministers, in a generic sense of the word now, will probably be the second most important or even a co-equal important portfolio in government alongside the finance ministers because financial capital is just one dimension. And we know that you know, the singular vision of financial capital defining everything in our societies has surpassed its zenith. The environment ministers will, if you want, be the custodians of the natural capital of our societies or the natural wealth, if you want, of our economies. And in that sense, I think we have every reason to continue to hold on to that vision that we need an expression of that um, portfolio, of that responsibility in our societies because it is the best guarantee that science will continue to drive a kind of development discourse where the future in, as the King said, maybe 10 years from now, 20 years from now, will be significantly moved to a different trajectory than we have managed in the last 20 or, you know, some would say 40 years. So these are just a few mm. thoughts and thank you again for this warm welcome and looking forward to this afternoon together with you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, it's really interesting to uh, just to listen to your sort of rhetorics as the head of UNEP, of course, if you compare to the past where environment was really isolated, of course, from many other aspects, and now you're talking about development as a very integrated part also of, envir of environmental issues. And I think that is a shift, to be honest. I mean, I, if we look historically, we, we, have been, we have been separating these issues, uh, unfortunately, too much. Um, just to, if I can ask one quick question to you, because as you said, I mean, you talked about governance and, and the, the need to strengthen UNEP from this particular aspect, as you also said, but we also talk about the UN system to deliver more as one, and of course we have many other agencies focusing on development and so on. What, is, is it enough, you believe, to actually reform UNEP, or is that only to be seen in a major or a bigger reform of the UN system, to actually be able to, to respond to this? very cross-sectoral issues? Two very brief answers. I think, first of all, multilateralism in general and the United Nations at the beginning of the 21st century, I think, is in a, uh, in a, has reached an inflection point where I think governments have to either re, reconfigure mm. the way they want to run the multilateral system or it will continue to, let's say, meander along as a place where you, you know, carry out your conflicts without consequence. I mean, much of what we see in terms of these frustrating debates are that there is a very low price to delaying things in multilateral processes at the moment. And I think it is more a reflection of the state of geopolitics right mm. now. And I can't go into it now. You know, the, the, the emerging economies, I mean, they are... They have emerged economically, but they have not emerged geopolitically. Cold War consequences, I mean, the shift in Europe uh, versus uh, US, the transatlantic relationship, a lot of things are changing. And I think in some ways the UN is suffering from a sort of syndrome of benign neglect mm. uh, in terms of actually really reforming it. So it is, a, it is an old institution with an absolutely vital future mission. Mm. I mean, that is, uh, you know, in, in, in rhetorical terms. Now, on the issue of mainstreaming, you know, there is often this argument that people make that, you know, if you want to mainstream an issue such as environment, then you shouldn't really build up a strong environmental institution. 
Um, in theory, you're right. In practice, I think it's a completely wrong approach. Mm. I think you mainstream by having a strong core institution for mm. the issue. That's how you actually achieve, in a sense, ripple effects through the system. So, you know, an upgrading of UNIP is by no stretch of the imagination going to, you know, be the answer to making environmental sustainability become a mainstream issue. But I think without strengthening both the environment ministers and also the environmental institution within the United Nations system, you will, in a sense, always relegate environment if it is taken care of by others as being exactly that, a secondary or tertiary issue. Mm. So I believe you need a strong anchor institution that is constantly, in a sense, uh, working into the system. And if you look at UNEP today, we, you know, green jobs, green economy with ILO, with UNIDO, with FAO and agriculture, with UNDP. I mean, we are networked with mm. many parts of the UN system, but we're actually, if you want, almost the weakest link. When the international community brought finally a chunk of money to the table to support the implementation of so-called incremental costs of environmental agreements, what did it do? It didn't put the money in the institution where the environment ministers would actually be the drivers. It took it and put it in a trust fund called the Global Environment Facility, mm -hmm. in which we probably mm -hmm. soon will have to exit because we cannot operate anymore under the conditions under which that fund is establishing itself as a separate entity. And I could go on with many mm -hmm. stories, and this is where I believe um, a strong environmental institution is actually the precondition for mainstreaming, mm -hmm. uh, obviously always with the risks of mission creep and uh, the usual bureaucratic tendencies, but I think you know, the lower risk is that rather than mm -hmm. leaving um, you know, UNEP and therefore the environmental platform in the UN where it was put in 1972, mm -hmm. and you, know, you have to remember, a few days, I don't know if any of you were here, a few days before the Stockholm conference, the Swedish ambassador to the UN in New York said, and I can guarantee you there will be no institutions established in Stockholm. And UNEP was born out of an absolutely you know, dramatic set of last minute political compromises. So its design from the beginning was uh, essentially to put environment, and keep it in a box. And I mean, we today even know about the Brussels group and you know, some of our great uh, European nations were part of making sure that this thing would stay where mm. it belonged. Mm. So, which, is, which was scary. Two yes. views of it, yeah. Thank you very much. And also for the hope, of course, that the environment minister in the future will be the second strongest. <laughs> we know from Sunita Narayan, many know, knows her, of course. She's always arguing that the Indian monsoon is the real finance minister in India, uh, which is uh, moving in that direction. Johan. Could I ask you maybe to come up and also give a reflection uh, on, the, on what uh, Achim has said, but also, of course, other aspects that you want to bring up. And maybe we have, we have four colleagues who will give their reflections in different, uh, from different aspects. If you can stay to around five minutes, that would be great. Um, I'll be, I'll yeah. be very brief to give space for, for a discussion also exactly. with, <coughs> with Achim. And, and just, first a, just a couple of, of reactions to what you said. First, I really like your, um, your optimism <coughs> with regard to not um, you know, not shed away from the opportunity of surprise in Rio. And I think that is really good news for us because, mm -hmm. as you may know, or you've even received an invitation to be part of our, our slow variable into the whole process, which is to carry the science message through our Nobel Symposium process, which started five years back and which will be culminating right at the tail end, in a way, will be communicating right at the heads of state gathered in Rio. And who knows, that might be a the kind of knowledge shockwave which we would like to uh, see in, in hopefully turning into something unexpected. And then um, it's an enormous boost for us also, your reflection on the Anthropocene, which, which we today internally equate with, with the Copernican revolution. Because what, what it does, and I think one should actually start reasoning around the Anthropocene in the context of the green economy, because um, it might be a bit over-optimistic, but what if it is so that the rapidly growing economies of the world and their leaders are suspicious to the green economy because they're starting to understand the Anthropocene? Because it's only in the Anthropocene that you can suspect that the green economy might hamper your own development, because it's in the Anthropocene that we start hitting the ceiling of, of what is a safe operating space for a carbon budget, a nitrogen budget, for key resources like land or also earth rare earth metals, and, and if the Brazilian leadership suddenly says that, you know, we don't want to hear anything about planetary boundaries in, in the mm -hmm. Ban Ki-moon high-level panel on global sustainability, it might simply be because they're starting to see that if we sign on to anything that, that sort of, say, forces us to think in terms of the Anthropocene, it actually means that we have to collaborate 
among all countries in the world to share a finite space, not a relative space, but a finite space, which totally turns around the whole issue on economics. Because suddenly a price on the environment won't be enough because we simply need to have some, some really hard targets. So I think the Anthropocene and the green economy is, is perhaps where, where the discourse really hits each other. And that might be something we, we could also reflect and contribute to from, from our side. We have time and time again run into exactly this issue that, well, if, if we undersign anything with regards to green economy going beyond just putting a, a price on natural capital, then that might be undermining our right to development. And I think that's, that's an issue that there's a lot of knowledge in this building to combine those two issues on inclusive green economy while still um, adhering to global sustainability goals. But then just my, my final round off is, is on, on the point agenda, which is what role can science play? Mm. And it's absolutely clear, of course, that we need to shorten the distance between knowledge and action. And it's, it's wonderful to see how much we can help each other there. I mean, Joe Alcamo, who's your chief scientist, has been pushing us very, very hard within the new initiative, the new Future Earth Initiative, to try and shorten this distance. But I think there are two additional um, dimensions to, to, the, to the responsibility of science, which is one, to not only shorten the distance, but also to go from diagnostics to look more into transformative solutions. And again, that's an area of emerging science where I think there is enormous value in, in a stronger partnership with not only agencies like UNIP, but also with the private sector, with, with let's call it stakeholders at large, and, and, and do this kind of research in a more transdisciplinary way. And again, we are exploring that kind, of, um, that kind of research. But then the third pillar is, of course, the difficult one, which is to connect and integrate the social natural sciences. And that is the hub of the entire mm. Future Earth mm. effort of trying to realize that we cannot only go on doing diagnostics of problems, but really start exploring the true integrated science mm. and, and therefore also come closer to solutions. And, and the dilemma there, of course, is that this will take time. So somehow we need a dual track here of action mm. versus insights. And it would be really interesting to reflect around that as well. How can we, how can we within the current governance economic domain. I mean, even if, uh, even if you transform UNIP, it will take time. And how do we act over the next mm. five, six, seven years when we've entered the decade when we have to start bending the curves mm. uh, very, very rapidly? So um, we hope you hang in there as head of UNIP for at least another, uh, at least until Stockholm plus 50, so we can get down to business. <laughs> Well, but Johan, but just to, if you could say one thing, because you said, uh, which is of course quite worrying on the fact that the Brazilian government is actually quite strongly sort of against any text uh, referring to the planetary boundaries. They see that as a, as, a, as, a, as a limit to development, of course, very much. But at the same time, my understanding is that the concept of planetary boundaries is, is taking off quite well in many developed countries, which of course should be even more worried about the fact, because we can argue that they have already transgressed what what are their rights to develop? Why do you think that, uh, in particular, sort of the developing countries, but of fast developing countries, are, are suspicious about this? Well, I, I, I should start by saying that there is um, there, there's a there's a there's a very mixed picture. Mm. I mean, the, let's say the the minister for the environment in, in Brazil is enthusiastic, mm. like anyone, with regard to thinking around a planetary boundaries framework to support sustainable development in, in a globalized era of, mm. of environment and development. The problem is when the whole notion enters the Ministry for Finance, mm. and they start suddenly seeing that, okay, because we don't trust the richer countries in the world, mm. we don't trust that the rich countries in the world will do their part mm. of so their promises, well, then that means that if we suddenly underwrite that we have, have a cap, some kind of agreed absolute ceiling on carbon, but also on, on many of the, of, the, of the living life support systems on Earth, how will we then assure that Brazil can continue mm. over the next 20 years to really accelerate growth? Mm. So it's, it's simply an hypothetical suspicion that we won't, that not all the countries in the world will mm. do their share. I think that, that's the really hard mm. core issue. That's why I think the green economy collides with the Anthropocene. Interestingly Probably enough, yeah. mm. nobody talks of the Anthropocene, but I think more and more we're starting to see this kind of scramble for the remaining mm. um, space, ecological space, resource space, but also atmospheric space in the world. 
And, and one should recognize, I, I mean, if you read the Ban Ki-moon high-level report, I can't be sure, but I think it's the first time ever in, in, a, in a policy context that the first paragraph talks of the risk of catastrophic tipping points. Mm. So suddenly, which was not there in 1992 and was not there in Johannesburg in 2001, the notion that we might simply see surprise also in, in, in the fundamentals of our economy. Mm. And of course, that, that is, you could call that understanding the Anthropocene. Mm. So I think that's also a part of, of why this is so challenging right mm. now. Okay. But it also shows that, that the environment is climbing up into the policy, up in the policy ladder. I mean, you mm. have ministers of finance who are suddenly realizing that, okay, this is really central for, mm. for strategy. So at least in the beginning, it's actually okay that Minister of Finance are negative because it means that they at least see the, see the issue. Now we have to turn them to be more positive about That's it. That's right. But you remember, Kalle, that you remember the, the press release we wrote after the first International Resilience Science Conference 2008? We hosted it here in Stockholm, the first scientific conference on resilience. And in that press release, we suggested for governments in the world to put the Minister for the Environment above the Minister for Finance. Mm -hmm. So we support right. them. <laughs> So, so considering what we've talked about quite a lot here, about the Anthropocene and how we should actually govern or what kind of governance we need to manage the Anthropocene. The fact, of course, that we, we, we talked about the role of UNEP and the multilateral system, but of course, in the end, it, it is about governments, states, the, the systems that we do have. Osa Persson, uh, she's a research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute and is actually focusing on research quite a lot on this. So maybe you can give us some, some perspectives of that, please. I'll do my best. Um, so you asked about some insights in relation to this, the ongoing discussions on the institutional framework for sustainable development in this real process. But I think, um, uh, and, and perhaps, hopefully you will get some interesting comments. Uh, but I, I also wanted to pick up on this, what you said about living in the Anthropocene and what you and also continue talking about. Uh, and exactly what, what is the role of the state in the Anthropocene? What sort of is qualitatively different about the Anthropocene and the governance challenges it raises? Does it mean an expanded role for the state or a sort of uh, less relevant state? And uh, what sort of, I take some inspiration here from a very interesting panel discussion we had at the Plans Under Pressure uh, conference in London involving some governance scholars and Johan Rockström and and also UNEP colleague, uh, Mr. Ibrahim Sio. And uh, to, to, we asked our panelists then to sort of choose a scenario for governance actually in relation to planetary boundaries, uh, which they thought would be more realistic and ideal. Uh, and those scenarios for two were very sort of state focused. One was a kind of supranational top-down burden sharing agreements in relation to the various planetary boundaries. The second one was more of a real politic, uh, governments negotiating on a more sort of uh, ad hoc basis around certain issues. Um, the iconic picture we had was the Copenhagen uh, deal. Um, and the third one was uh, sort of non uh, governance being performed by non-state actors, us as consumers making choices, private, um, private sector sort of imposing certain constraints on itself, etc. So, um, and we had, of course, uh, everyone said, oh, it's going to be a mix of all those models. <laughs> um, but I think a sort of mistake we made when contrasting these uh, different models and sort of state versus non-state actors is that we, pr it's, it's a false dichotomy. Um, so uh, what I want to get to is really, what, what is, is there something like um, non-state actors acting in the shadow of hierarchy? Uh, so I think climate change is, is the prime example of this, where some commentators obviously now point out that the climate negotiations have stagnated, they're not uh, leading to any sort of progress, and all the interesting progressive initiatives are coming from the bottom up, from private actors and civil society, local governments. Uh, and this is sort of taking place within a general uh, trend where the state is being hollowed out. Uh, whereas others believe that it's, it's climate change is ultimately about a public good and it's a prisoner's dilemma, so we need to have an international agreement with binding targets. 
uh, and also pointing out the fact that states are actually expanding their man mandate. They are adopting new climate-related legislation, etc. Uh, and I, I also, during your talk, I, I reacted on hearing a lot about governments and their responsibility, <coughs> perhaps a little bit less on the role of private sector and non-state actors. So that, it would be really interesting if you could comment a bit more on that. However, uh, so I would propose this, should we rather see these as, uh, not as two sort of alternatives, but rather understand the dynamic here so that, for example, uh, the climate, the, the UNFCCC has not really delivered any uh, major new agreements now, and they've sort of, we've seen that deadlines for coming to agreements have been sort of um, gradually postponed. But the fact that it's there, does that provide some sort of legitimacy of the whole issue, and does it create expectations uh, for these other actors to, to take, to sort of uh, perform self-governance, take action uh, despite this sort of overall agreement? So I think the key insight that we need to consider is that individuals and the private sector, we're not just uh, passively reacting to regulation imposed on, on us, but uh, we do actively anticipate regulation as so we start preparing for a changing world. So to, to sum up, I think it would be really interesting to hear you sort of, this notion of shadow of hierarchy, does it resonate with you? Do you think it's powerful or not? And also if, it's at all possible that UNEP could play some role in uh, contributing in sketching these visions of future global governance um, so, that so that actors have sort of some scenarios or benchmarks uh, to uh, shape those expectations uh, against. Uh, what will the future look like? And Obviously, these debates are going on within academia and within civil society. Lots of proposals are being made, but if they could somehow enter a more political forum, and obviously there are lots of political sensitivities around this, could it sort of um, stimulate some change? Okay, Thanks. thank you very much. Uh, what we will do, I, you know, I will give you uh, some some chance later on, later on, later off, uh, uh, Achim, to also respond to some of these comments, um, and we can ask the two last speakers also, and maybe invite some comments also from the audience. So maybe I can ask you to come up now, Thomas Hahn, who is assistant professor here at the Stockholm uh, Resilience Center, Collaborative Environmental Management, and we've talked a lot about green economy here or already now, and. Um, the hopes or not hopes for what the green economy actually could do and, and present to us as, as a tool maybe to move forward. Um, I also know from the little text that you sent to me that you, you have actually added one of the things that I, I really personally burn very much for in the collaboration between UNEP and, and UNDP. Oh, I will not talk about that. Uh, well, I know, but it's, you know, it's an interesting idea about <laughs> when we talk about UN reform, but you can talk whatever you want. Yes. You, know, you don't, you want... <laughs> Thank you, Johan, and Johan, and Johan. <laughs> um, okay, my background is also in economics. In agriculture university, I was so I was working and teaching in environmental economics and ecological economics and institutional economics for the last 20 years. So of course I was very happy to see the report on green economy. It was I think it was Maria Schultz who gave it to me last year. I thought, wow, here it's on top of, top of the agenda, my topic. So I was enthusiastic when reading this report, and then afterwards I found out that there were many skeptics from developing countries and uh, even the BRIC countries. So I wonder, why are they so skeptical? Could it be that they are skeptical for, for um, ontological reasons, that they don't like the, the framing that uh, put prices and values on nature? Because I remember in, um, 20 years ago when Sweden had the first carbon tax, uh, people from the environmental movement, they were against this. They said, you can't put a price on nature. That makes nature a commodity. Mm -hmm. And then I tried to explain, because I was just a fresh environmental economist, that no, no, the, the, this, the purpose is not that it be, to put a price. The purpose is just to make it, uh, to, to overcome the opportunity cost and, and to make it more expensive and so on. And actually, as soon as the government, I think it was a social democratic government to, to instigate this tax, and then the tax worked. And suddenly, <laughs> the, the liberal-minded politicians who were in favor of the tax, because it was a market-based market uh, uh, instrument, they were against the tax because industry complained and they took part of in, they took the joint, uh, their voice. Whereas the, the environmental, environmental movement were very enthusiastic 
So I was thinking maybe people are against the green economy because of ontological reasons. They don't like the framing and they don't like the way we talk about it. But they will be convinced as soon as they see the results. So that was my optimistic interpretation. But then I went to this meeting with Maria Schulz in Ecuador and met many people from Third World Network. And uh, I realized that this is more difficult. It's not just, not just okay, misunderstanding or bad information about the effects. They're actually more profound, profound criticism. And, I, and then I read, I read the report once more, and I saw that, yeah, you talk about poverty alleviation a lot. But it's not as convincing, th th those parts. Not, not so many examples of how actually have Kenya benefited from this. How have poor people who take the bus uh, in, in Kenya benefited more than the people who drive the big uh, vehicles? Uh, because I, I'm, firm believe, I'm a firm, firm believer that if you want to address poverty and income distribution, it's a very stupid thing to, 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 uh, to subsidize fossil fuels. There are many more efficient ways to, uh, to poverty elevation than, than fossil fuel subsidies. So, for that purpose, uh, so I'm totally convinced with the green economy. And I think the green economy is very convincing when it comes to economic and environmental efficiency. But efficiency is not everything. And um, in institutional economics, um, we don't talk so much about efficiency. And I think the same thing in, in resilience theory. Uh, what is efficiency? There, there's not even a mm. word like that. Resilient ecosystems or resilient systems, whatever the social ecological systems, nurture diversity and uh, actually invest in redundancy, which is very inefficient according to both economics and political science, which is just reduce redundancy. But resilience theory says, no, we should have redundancy and we should have diversity. So there is something here, and even TIB, uh, the economics of ecosystems and uh, biodiversity, um, they have uh, actually acknowledged this, saying that the total economic value must include the insurance value of biodiversity and the mm -hmm. insurance value of resilience. So I think there is actually interesting economic um, theory that I don't see much of in green economy as it is now. I see some of it in TIB. And I think um, my question to you is, in, in institutional economics, at least some, some parts of that, for example, Aril Vatten, who, is the, who was the chairperson of European, European Society for Ecological Economics, and he says that <coughs> instead of just evaluating policies for efficiency, we could use legitimacy mm. as the evaluation. And then you can talk about process legitimacy and outcome legitimacy. And the process is, of course, about involvement, about how different people get involved and understand this thing. So it's about ontological issues that are on the board and can actually discuss this. And the outcome efficiency is about three things. Effectiveness. Of course, the, the, the policy must work. It must yield some result. And also, it must have positive synergies, maybe, with other, with income distributions and other things, um, with other policy arenas. And then there's the cost efficiency. Of course, it's always important to have cost efficiency. And the third one is equity, <clears throat> equity legitimacy. And I think that is a more, uh, a more holistic approach to, uh, to think about uh, policy recommendations and not just focus on, on efficiency, which, this, uh, which I think is the main focus in, in green economy. Mm. Because efficiency is extremely convincing. And I think uh, at, in, whether you study neoclassical economics or institutional economics, it's totally convincing, the, the green economy. But I think, um, so my, to, my question to you is, if um, the framework of, uh, of how you market green economy, how, how, you, how you make it convincing, could be extended by using a legitimacy framework from institutional economics. That's my simple question. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. And you've seen we turned around. Normally, of course, you as a policymaker should ask the questions to the researchers, uh, and we should provide the answers. So now we are turned around here, and, and uh, I hope you, I, I'm sure you have a couple of responses on this very soon. But let me also invite uh, Mr. Francis Johnson, Senior Research Fellow at Stockholm Environment Institute, and maybe a little bit a different perspective. We've talked quite a lot about rather broad concepts, governance, green economy, the Anthropocene, planetary boundaries. 
But in the end, if we listen to a lot of discussions also at Stockholm Plus 40, and I'm sure in Rio it will be about water, it will be about energy, it will be about food security. I mean, fundamental resources for development. And one of the things you are looking at, Francis, is of course the whole issue of energy and renewable energy. And I know you have sometimes even quite controversial questions or conclusions, so, and they need to be brought hopefully, up as well. Hopefully. Yeah, I know. <coughs> so please, Francis. Um, yeah, one thing that struck me also in this discussion here is so, this similarity between UNEP and SEI in that uh, the ability to work on the big assessments but also recognizing the importance of working on the ground. And <clears throat> actually I think w this is a big challenge in our work is to bridge this gap between the big assessments where all kinds of expectations are created and then the reality of development work which is even in this modern day and age still a dirty process that takes time and takes a lot of perseverance. You cannot work on environment and then add a development twist or work on development and add an environment twist. Our, our mission here is to look at the intersection, you know, and in fact, look at those, find those creative intersections where you can pursue um, both goals. And we've worked for many years on renewable energy, energy access in sub-Saharan Africa and also more recently on, on carbon finance and, and um, uh, climate adaptation. And I guess, um, one of the things about some of the on-the-ground work you discover is that development projects, sometimes they seem like Hollywood movies in the sense that, uh, you know, only one out of every ten Hollywood movies uh, makes money, actually. Uh, and so somehow it has to pay for the other nine. That means it has to be a blockbuster, right? And so there can be a tendency to think that uh, everyone, you know, is attracted to the, to the big hit, the thing that, that does everything. But in fact, we have to think about those other nine. Um, more, in fact. I guess this relates to resilience uh, theory because it's diversity, redundancy, um, and so forth. And so if you're thinking about the, the green economy, of course, with, with decentralized renewables, which um, of course we are, we are pushing now, particularly uh, we have experience with uh, bioenergy and also with solar PV, that here you get 100 times as many jobs per unit of energy as fossil nuclear or even large hydro. You know, not just 10 times as many jobs, not just 20, but 100, you know. So this is the, this is the potential that, that needs to be unleashed. And so the, we work a lot with our partners in Africa. And here you see there are some opportunities in some cases to jump over this dirty phase of development um, that the OECD countries that went through. But, you know, what does this require? Well, in my opinion, it, it requires what I call the three I's infrastructure, institutions, and investment. And, but in a big way, you know, a lot more than we have today, and, and maybe not tinkering at the margins is going to be enough, which maybe suggests that you do sometimes need that blockbuster because it creates the attention to, to move things forward. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, looking at, at what has happened in recent years, some years ago the world mobilized several trillion dollars to bail out banks and insurance companies. And I think for, for sustainable energy finance, we're not even getting 1% of that. So somehow, how to, how to ramp up that investment and how to connect it to our objectives uh, on the ground. So I guess that's the challenge. I don't have a specific question like the other speakers, but, but that's the general point. Well, I mean, Francis, if, I'm, if I may though, because you did add uh, one thing I, th I thought that was very interesting in the, in the points that you sent to me. You know, this, this challenge a little bit, because we talked about it earlier, the challenge a little bit about what kind of energy systems are we pushing in different parts of the world? And renewable, oh, yeah. <clears throat> renewable energy can be, at least initially, quite expensive compared, for instance, to fossil fuels. Right, and so, and so we run into this situation where we can't always, uh, you know, we can't put everything in, in, a, in one box, as you say. So we can't insist in, in, with our partners that, oh, you, you, you know, you can only adopt renewables. In some cases, it will do, be too expensive. So, for example, instead of using traditional biomass, they might use LPG. So we cannot be a sort of doctrinaire in our approach either. Um, and again, it goes with this, with this idea of, of diversity and, and decentralized. And, and after all, in, in the OECD countries, we are 95% we are non-renewable in a lot of countries. Mm. So we cannot push this. At the same time, looking for these creative intersections. Mm. Um, but being careful, of course, for example, photovoltaics. Do you really want to take the most expensive source of energy and put it in the poorest 
place in the world. Mm. So some care is needed with, with, uh, from that perspective. Mm. Okay, so thank you very much. So we've had uh, these four uh, additional in interventions. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, I don't know if maybe you could uh, provide your, some of your reactions on this. I mean, there are ma many issues, questions that, that came up in this, so we don't expect <laughs> a full-fledged answer. And you have, of course, the opportunity to you know, throw it back and say, well, give me the research results, and I will <laughs> tell you that I will take action. Um, so if uh, you may um, respond a, a bit on that and maybe see if there are some additional questions also coming up. So well, maybe that might be a good idea because I mean <clears throat> we cannot conclude these kinds of questions, no. but just a quick reaction. I mean, moving from the diagnostic to solutions, Johan, absolutely. I think this is our uh, responsibility as a generation now sitting in these institutions. I think. Uh, with everything that we have at our disposal, including money, institutions, knowledge, uh, evidence, empirical data, we must have more courage with solutions um, and not simply describe to the world what's wrong with it. And I think that particularly for our institutions, I mean, although we are very different, I think that is perhaps one very common thread. So I just want to accentuate that. As I mentioned, the role of the state, I think it's a very interesting one. To me, um, I think we have finally liberated ourselves from the polarity of state versus, well, who? The private sector, the marketplace, the consumer, the ignorant citizen. Um, I think we spent 30 years in a, in a kind of ideological battle, which I think was more a reflection of, you know, the fact that societies were at different stages of evolving their governance and democracy and public participation systems. But quite frankly, at the beginning of the 21st century, and <clears throat> if you don't believe it, just look to North Africa, it's no longer a question of, you know, the state will do it for you, nor will the state be allowed to do it all for you. Um, I don't think that is really an option anymore. I mean, even the country uh, such as China is reinventing its governance system every day. I mean, we've mm. just seen the last few weeks how sometimes very public and how very often very internally these debates take place. I think here the question is more, what is the, the intelligent way in which governance can articulate public choice in regulatory frameworks mm -hmm. that allow economies to evolve. And I say economies because it's not just markets, because economies are essentially consumption and production, consumer choice, production choices. And I think where we see societies really uh, accelerating this, it is precisely because the state becomes a vehicle of expression of public choice and preference which in turn translates into you know, the social market economy or the Bolivarian economy or whatever it may be. And that's why I keep on defending the green economy concept that it is not beholden to a single ideology. Because the converse is also true that none of the social systems before valued environment in such a way as to ensure sustainability. Whether you're a communist, capitalist, Bolivarian or, or Cuban. Although actually, ironically enough, Cuba was probably of many of the let's say, regulatory frameworks, one of the earliest to embody sustainability as an integral part of the responsibility mm. of the state on behalf of the people. I mean, it's something that people don't like hearing. But you can go back to Cuba and already see in the 60s a conservation initially and then later on also a sustainability um, ethic. And I think it had something to do with the fact that whatever the, you know, the human rights dimensions and the manifestation of a political system is, um, a political system can deliver into a society a set of norms and standards that are essentially uh, captured in a set of laws and regulations. And I think therein lies to me also my great enthusiasm for the green economy as an evolving field of study to understand where do societies succeed in doing that from a social, you know, political process, not ignorant of the political economy, and I think mm. that's something that I would say, Thomas, um, you know, we need to also talk about, because one of the things that people so have things stuck in their throat on is the political economy. Uh, you know, are we ignorant of political economy? How can you say that, you know, the green economy is relevant to uh, different political systems? I mean, I, I had a very interesting debate last Friday, you know, on this McPlanet panel. I had to in the end say, look, I, I actually did study political science, so, but I will still <laughs> maintain uh, that point of view that there is a point at which a certain number of principles apply and then political mm. systems choose different avenues by which they give expression to mm. that. So I would say the role of the state in the Anthropocene becomes more important, not in the sense of its absolute 
volume of authority, but in terms of its ability to translate faster and more precisely that which needs to be um, articulated as public choice in order for markets to function more efficiently, for economies to better um, also take a care of resilience, for instance, right? I mean, the problem with market capitalism is that it essentially um, denies the notions of redundancy and resilience, right? Because mm. it will exploit something to the limits, right? Whether you associate that now with, you know, the tragedy of the commons kind of logic or with a simple example of if a tuner in the oceans today fetches a quarter of a million dollars, you'll damn well try and find the damn last tuner in the oceans, right? Because it will make you a lot of money. Mm. And we actually, as a society, collectively subsidize fisheries at a point in time when they're collapsing all over the oceans with $27 billion in subsidies. What are they being used for? Cheaper fuel and bigger nets. And this is the logic of a paralyzed public choice system and a market gone mad. Or as you know, Pavan Sukhdev, in a sense, called it in the team work, uh, a market failure of historical proportions, right? And I think that, that is why it is not the state versus the market or the state versus the citizen. It is the state as a vehicle of citizens giving values, norms, and standards to define the parameters of how an economy functions. And the beauty is that the private sector can cope with it perfectly well. Mm. You have you know, a company that made its living out of trees is now selling cell phones and soon maybe not selling them anymore. But <laughs> um, you know, we have seen these transitions happen time and again. So I think that is where you know, we underestimate and also uh, in a sense, I'm misled by entrepreneurial lobbying because nobody wants to give up something that makes a good buck. Mm. But the fact that the private sector can today say, you know, in Germany the lights will go out without nuclear energy and tomorrow disinvest from all nuclear energy mm. because mm. it basically knows that its market is gone and now invest in renewable energy is to me fascinating. It took less than six months mm. and a billion dollars of maybe revenue loss, but I mean that helps sometimes to focus the attention. Um, very briefly on the green economy, very interesting Thomas, and I would really welcome if you can maybe write a little bit of that up in just a page or two of critique, because I think what you pointed to is the first, to me, helpful uh, articulation of where I think the green economy is not capturing some form of, uh, let's say, there is an emotional deficit and there is an analytical deficit, mm. right? Because the green economy, the body of work, is a compilation of extraordinary quality considering the many players who contributed to it, and I still think it is a fascinating document, but it is not a fully mature discourse. And I think this notion that efficiency is not everything, uh, legitimacy versus efficiency, as you put it, on process and outcome, I think is very interesting. And um, I think it is, you know, it's not just a marketing problem, but I think it is a problem of marketing also the green, or, or positioning the green economy mm. discourse. Because my observation is that, first of all, 95% of the people who are commenting on the green economy have never even looked at the green no. economy report. So what we're actually finding is a sort of shadow uh, battle of I hate multinationals, therefore the green economy seems to be saying that multinationals have a role to play, I hate the green economy. Technology is dominated by multinationals, therefore I dislike technology and therefore I will fight the green economy because it actually says technology can be useful. And it's at that guttural level that a lot of the discussions happen and I find that intellectually dissatisfying, but that's you know, irrelevant because if people are at that point, we have to, in a sense, build a bridge in this discourse. Mm. More complicated is the issue of the political economy. I mean, if you talk about land and land rights and you know what is happening in parts of latin america with you know the latifundistas the ruralistas and you know the whole tragedy of um the capturing of the state on behalf of the few then you know to look to the state as a vehicle for promoting the green economy you know has a certain credibility challenge mm -hmm. and i don't know what the answer to that is but i think it is something we have to capture because part of latin america's reflex response the green economy again has little to do with the analysis inside the report, but more the sort of news that, well, they seem to think that you can have agribusiness involved in sustainable agriculture, which by definition is inconceivable to somebody who has had their father shot by somebody who has taken the land away from them, right? So, I mean, there is a social reality, and I think what you pointed with legitimacy is a very interesting um, perspective. I would challenge a little bit more the issue on poverty, um, because I think there the report does make a more compelling case, but I think it is, again, an area where we need a lot more work. Mm. I am intuitively convinced since a long time that 
we needed to articulate this green economy case, and particularly TEEP was, I think, a vital building block of that, and you know, credit to all those who made TEEP come about, that we understood how vital biodiversity and ecosystems are to the livelihoods of often the poorest, right, and the most vulnerable, and that in the name of development, we have often redistributed the very resource on which they rely in order to satisfy the needs of mm. others. And I lived through that very much in the World Commission on Dams, because this mm. is the ultimate instrument of redistributing natural functionality in terms of services and, and resilience and value from one group of users to another. And the tragedy of the dams is not that you know, they were stupid technologies, they were a social and economic disaster. Um, <coughs> finally, this notion of creative intersections um, that you talked about, I think this is, well, there you are, yeah. I think that is precisely where I think our time has come. Uh, in inverted commas, right? And our time, I don't mean that, you know, we're beating others in society to sort of the, the golden pot, but rather we have constantly faced the problem that we talk about one set of phenomena while society was preoccupied with another set of phenomena. I think it is by being able today to challenge this compartmentalization where it is jobs versus sustainability or, you know, the last 150 years we have been caught in this myth that environment will always in a sense, be protected at the expense of the economic well-being or progress and vice versa. It is the creative intersections which now fundamentally challenge that. And I think the jobs issue, and that's why the work with the trade unions, the ILO, was in a sense the, the mother of the green economy mm. work. And it was very interesting that it came mm. through the jobs angle that we looked at mm. this. So um, I, I just want to ask you also to please send me this, the statistic of 100 times more jobs, because I think that one, we are coming out with another Green Jobs Report in a few weeks' time with ILO leading that work. But to me, the debate has finally come to a point where maybe we no longer you know, walk out of a studio or a cabinet meeting and lose the argument because of the kilowatt hour price, but because we're actually able to show that not only might you just pay 5% you know, more, but you actually get a 30% greater return in terms mm -hmm. of jobs per kilowatt hour investment that is undertaken. And that is the reason why we're moving to renewables as much as carbon dioxide or other things. Mm. And I think that is why I like this term creative intersections very much. But um, just a few sort of reactions yeah, and questions. Thank you. And thank you for coming back to the, actually the, the issues you brought up from the beginning. The fact that we have to broaden the agenda and include the whole issue of the fact that many people are unemployed. We have 50% unemployment in Spain. If we do not address these issues in parallel, we cannot move the agenda forward. I, we, I think that is critical. Actually, we know that you have to leave in about 20 minutes, and we are supposed to have a short uh, meeting as well. Uh, but could I maybe, Kalle, do you want, do you have some a short maybe comment or question to, to make as well? I think, uh, is it? it, it is it's it? for the web, so okay. don't, yeah. Um, I think it's. But speak up. To, to <laughs> me, it's really fantastic to hear the, the discussion here. I think when you're really describing the mind shift we're in right now, uh, really, really reconnecting back to uh, thinking through how can we at all be able to stu be stewards of our own future now. And I think it's, it's going pretty fast. Uh, you experienced this shift and I think I'm getting, I've been part of this game for a while, also to see this big shift actually. When we started up with ecological economics in mid 80s, uh, it wasn't there at all, but it's really, we're really getting there now. Mm. And, and uh, stop to get, get rid of this idea of environment on the one hand and development, it's really, it's really about our own future on this little round ball. But, but there's one aspect of it that I didn't hear so much in the discussions today, and that's the whole, uh, you, you mentioned it early on with the, the speed of change and, and the pace of change, that whole new phenomena as part of the Anthropocene of everything going much faster and the likelihood of interacting sort of shocks to the system. Because that's something we're wrestling with a lot here in relation to resilience. That's actually that's the whole motif for us to look at resilience, is to have the backs up, backups uh, in situations where, where you challenge uh, efficiency because of sudden surprises, mm -hmm. and uh, and we believe strongly that uh, we are in an era now of of global change where these type of new type of interactions will play out in a completely new and surprising way. And uh, and really, how how can we develop capacities of governance? systems to respond to that and I, mm. I think you alluded to it nicely with with using the market in the way in, in the sort of vehicle, being a vehicle for for these type of changes but how do we try to do that in, in a way that doesn't 
put us into new traps uh, to, to really make, make use of these changes for sustainable pathways instead of new, new development traps. So that's, that's a little reflection. Thank you very much. If we could take one more additional point only before we finalize. Yes, please, Maria, speak into the microphone, but speak loudly because... Yes, I will. Uh, so people um, here can hear two also. short um, remarks. One is uh, on uh, the need for sort of knowledge-rich society, you know, that we need uh, better uh, sort of scientific uh, um, influenced decision making and, and if you can see maybe that it's might that we might be in a, in a landmark now mind shift right now with uh, the IPBS established with the future Earth initiative and so on I can personally see some hope there <laughs> and it might be that you know society when you talk about norms and so that we actually are in a shift here that we understand better and better that humans and and the biosphere are so interlinked that we need this kind of norms and and this more uh, sort of uh, knowledge-rich society. And the other thing is uh, about dialogue. And, um, you know, that we... I can also see that uh, when you talk about the Green, re uh, green Economy Report, that um, some of the critiques has maybe been from also sites which actually haven't even read the report. And what we tried uh, with this Keto meeting I explained to you before about, and which Thomas uh, also referred to, you know, that we tried to sort of de-link uh, the negotiators from negotiation texts in a sort of informal dialogue on content together, together with other actors as scientists and other actors in society, you know, to create these kind of dialogues, uh, which I think also us actually uh, were aiming at a little bit, you know, that it could maybe be a future way to actually create better negotiations later as well, you know, if people have sort of got into actual content where they can actually find a common way forward together when it's not, when people aren't so stuck in negotiation texts. And so this kind of multi-actor for us, uh, if that could be something in international environmental governance, you know, to, to, to work with a little bit more informal discussions before formal negotiations. And so. Okay, so thank you. Yes, please, I, I was... One, to response. <coughs> One, you know, you just said uh, a term that's very interesting, science-rich or knowledge-rich societies. One, one of the reasons I think why we haven't touched much on it today, but I think the work that you've been doing with the Nobel... Um, Laureate Symposium. Uh, award, uh, uh, Laureate yeah. Symposium. The IPCC, now the emergence of IPBS also, um, Future Earth. I think there is a reason why these let's say, um, meta processes and, and perhaps platforms have emerged, and that is that society can't also cope with the cacophony of science hitting it daily in, mm. in, in its sort of limited ability to actually interpret science, right? Mm. Um, and it's another reason why, for example, we have, it's one of the roles I would be interested in your comments, we don't have time today, but please feel free in future discussion with our colleagues or with me or just send me an email. I see that as one of the important roles of UNIBORS because the UN, you know, one of the things it can deploy is a brand of a t certain degree of beyond national interest, mm, beyond singular uh, interests to facilitate at least a peer-reviewed process, you know, and despite all the, uh, you know, glacier uh, syndromes of the IPCC, I mean, I think that is one of the great success stories of how yeah. the UN was able to give science a almost protective custody beyond national interest. Remember, I mean, there were administrations that wanted to shut it down. And the emissions gap report is another experiment that we have, you know, in a sense undertaken, where everybody before the climate cops was issuing their own interpretation with different parameters and metrics, and nobody knew what on earth it meant. It's been remarkable to see this emissions gap report in its first year, which was 21 institutes coming together, sometimes I think to the uh, emotional distress of the individual scientists, but in the end coming out with one report, and from day one in Cancun, that report took center stage, and I think mm. watching this, and even the negotiators, I think, in part appreciated because it, it, it brought climate change negotiations uh, back to where human beings can actually comprehend mm. what we are trying to do, because the complexity had become so difficult that 80% of the people in the room didn't actually know what on earth was being discussed. And the emissions gap report was a wonderful sort of back to the basics, but you know, not 
not compromising science, but trying to find maybe the next level of indicator. So I, I see that also as a role that UNEP can play, but not as a, uh, in, in isolation, but really as part of a supply chain, so to speak, that society is desperately looking for. And IPBS, I mean, let's hope that that will be another way in which we can you know, address this issue. You know, I can't understand the future of my plan in terms of one frog species being discovered by CIA today and another one being lost over there. I have to be given a different way of looking at it, and particularly for policy makers. Mm -hmm. So just to pick up on that very important point. And thank you. I think that was also a very good conclusion. And of course, you know, appreciating the fact that you highlight some of the very important role that the multilateral system and an organization like UNEP really can have when it comes to credibility and when it comes to lifting an issue beyond national interest. And they're working very close together with, with science, I would argue, and being a vehicle for science to actually communicate in a trustworthy sense. And we've seen that in many different aspects and in the collaboration we've had. So thank you very much to you. Thank you to the colleagues, Thomas, Osa, and Francis, also providing your insights uh, into this discussion. Um, many other things I'm sure could be raised. Uh, we are very pleased that you could stay with us for such a long time in your agenda. And I, I hope I speak on behalf of Stockholm Resilience Center and even Bayer. Do I? OK. Uh, just want to check. <laughs> When I say that, you know, one thing that is, that is important for you to know, of course, as head of UNEP, like Johan also said, we have a lot of competence in this cluster of organizations, and we are really very willing to stand behind UNEP also, of course, when you are trying to push the agenda forward in the multilateral system. And whatever we can support there with our research, with our science, is, of course, something we, we, we are very much hoping to do as well. And I hope you, you feel that in your back when you're sitting in front of all these finance ministers that we hope will be in Rio and defending the, the sort of agenda of, of sustainable development. So thank you very much for attending this seminar.